Okay, welcome. We're ready to get started. This is the fifth meeting of the Chronic Hazard Advisory Panel on Phthalates and Phthalate Substitutes. Uh, this meeting is being, it's a public meeting. Uh, if you have not done so, please uh, sign the uh, attendance sheet, which is out in the hallway. Um, also, the meeting is being webcast live and will be recorded. Phil? Hey, Mike. I'd like to start off by uh, having the CHAP members uh, introduce themselves. Uh, my name is uh, Phil Merkus. Chris Jennings. This is Holger Koch. Andreas Kortenkamp. Russ Hauser. Bernard Schwetz. Paul Leoy. And I'm Mike Babich, the CPSC uh, project manager. Hey. Thank you. I, we are all here today. <clears throat> um, one of the first items that we wanted to discuss this morning, um, we're now looking at um, uh, a final product, which is uh, our report to CPSC. We wanted to discuss the issue of uh, peer review of our product and whether we want to have peer review and if we do, what, uh, what form it should take. So I open that up to the, the committee. For discussion. Tell us how that has been done in the past. Yeah, well, there's no requirement for peer review. Uh, the previous chap was not peer reviewed. Uh, I'm not sure about the the ones before that. Um, I think it's it's up to the panel. If you want to have some kind of informal peer review or something uh, a little more formal, um, we can certainly set that up. Uh, except, uh, however, uh, you know, a more formal process might add a little bit of time. Um, but that's really up to the panel. If you want to have, um, you know, certain pe people show parts different parts of the report to different people, or if you want to get a group to review the whole th thing, however you want to do it. To me, with the right reviewers, it, it always is good to have feedback. Um, yeah, and I think that there... Oh, okay. I was going to say the only issue would be the timing. If that yeah. takes us back to a deadline in December to have it reviewed by April, that's not going to be. Yeah, and if we set up a, you know, a, a formal process, we have a, a contractor actually uh, proposes reviewers, and, and it, it just takes a little time. Another way, you know, if you want to do it a little more informal process, I think we have a couple of, of people in mind to review the exposure scenarios part who are willing to do that and have expertise so you know if you had some people in mind to review the other sections I mean that's that's okay too uh, can, may I, 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 I think I'm in favor of a more formal peer review this time do it I agree with Andreas. Oh, this makes me feel good. <laughs> Why do we disagree that often? By formal, you mean have a contract? Yes. To do this? Yes. No, not not necessarily contract, but but have have external experts who look at it. Not not necessarily by contract. That, yeah. Well, what we have a a, a contract set up where. Uh, the Versar will propose a list of reviewers and 
do a whole process. That, I mean, they uh, have to make ag agreements with the peer reviewers, and in, in that case, that takes a little bit of time. Um, um, but we can, that's how we would, if you wanted a more formal one, that's what we would do. And then we, or the panel, certainly, I mean, you, usually the way it works is they propose some names of peer reviewers, and then we s say, gee, that's a good idea, or, you know, why don't you get somebody else or something like that. So... A bit more time. Well, trying to think of the process, they have to... I mean, if we start now, they can have everything set up in advance. Uh, it's a matter of timing. How long do you want the people to have to read it? And if it's going to be a long report, do you want everybody to review the whole thing or just their expertise? Um, and then they, they've got a sort of compile all the comments. I mean, how many for a report this side, size and this broad, I mean, how many peer reviewers want to have? Not more than five. And I think I'd rather have them review the, review the whole thing because if they don't, then we're going to have people who are going to be halfway between Never Never Land in reality. Can I ask? I think it, procedurally it would make sense if we suggested some, but it would make me feel a little better if then there was an instance or a, or a group of people maybe in CPSC who would then look at it and um, <coughs> draw in other people as well if they so feel. Okay. Is there a formal? So we have a really... Um, neutral process of selection of peer review. That's fine. That's fine. And if you, you know, again, it's up to you. If you wanted to have uh, people at the federal, uh, some of the other federal agencies or something like that, we can bring them in too. It's really up to, up to whatever the panel wants. Mike, can you, having gone through the lack of peer review of the first CHAP report on phthalates, can you, do you have a feeling that there would be a better document, a better process in place if there had been a peer review the first time that we're trying, what are we trying to fix by having all of this extra effort of a peer review? Um, you know, it, it, in, the, in the case of the previous chap, I don't think it would have changed much. Um, I mean, peer review always makes the report a little bit better, but on the other hand, uh, I think here the justification might be just because it's such a, um, the because of the implications of the report, it's a, it's a huge undertaking, and it's going to have, I think, implications probably well beyond CPSC. We, <clears throat> if we get comments from external reviewers who have the same level of expertise as the people around people around this table, we'll get a lot of comments. Yeah, and my question would be who's going to negotiate through all of those comments and transform the report to reflect what was said. Do, would we have to have another meeting to discuss, we're going to take these 29 comments and we're going to ignore these 42 and we're going to have to do more review, research kind of effort well, to be I, able I, to address these comments? I think you... It's best to decide ahead of time, are you going to, you know, actually write responses to the comments? You don't necessarily have to. Uh, 
Um, but it's good to think about those things. Hopefully, the comments won't require any major um, changes, rewrites, but um, it's always a, you never know. I guess my, part of my question is, <clears throat> and I don't know how this is normally, I don't remember how this is normally done in the IOM or other groups that go out for formal review. Some of the rest of you have been to that, mm -hmm. closer to that than I have in the last few years. But does the, the host organization, CPSC in this case, go through and make changes to the report based on the comments of the reviewers? Uh, no, we I think have discussion about what we're going to accept and what we're not going to accept. Yeah, I mean, I think the panel has got to got to make any changes, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't see any other way to do that. Uh, it 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 wouldn't be if CPSC made revisions; it wouldn't be your report. But we wouldn't, or maybe, I'm assuming we wouldn't be so interested in editorial type comments. We're more interested in substantive comments. If somebody said this paragraph would be better here, that's not really. Yeah, but that's also easy to, easy do, to do, so. But, yeah. If you're going to have peer review, you have to take into account what people say. Um, I don't think we have to formally respond to every comment, but I think we have to state which ones we accept and which ones we reject. And I think it's fair to do that. Since this, since this is not normally always done on CPSC's watch, where you have a peer review, uh, we just have to figure out what's the most efficient approach for us to uh, handle the situation. I mean, clearly there'll be some divergences um, in terms of the way they felt we approached it versus the way some other somebody else would approach approach it. But if you know if we can maintain our you know integrity about what we uh, what we did and why we did it, um, or adjust it accordingly, well, then we just state it. I have no problem with the peer review and doing it with the, the utmost care and scrutiny. Does the panel feel that we could do this by email? Good. I mean the peer review itself for responding to the Respond. comments? Yeah. yeah. Most NRC reports uh, I've been on, we do most of our response by mail. <clears throat> I think it depends on the nature of the changes. If we're going to make editorial changes, that's one thing, but if we're going to make conceptual changes in direction of how we interpret data and that we're including new data, I don't see how we can do that by email and have that be considered a public process. Conference call. Conference if, it's a, if, it's something, if it's something really serious, we can have a conference call. Conference call that's open to the public. Of course. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the, well, brings to mind, would the comments be oh, uh, public, they might have to be. Well, maybe not, but being that the report isn't public until it's released. Right. Can we not adopt a procedure equivalent to uh, what NRC does? It's very straightforward, like Paul has described. Yeah. Peer review is done by email, responses are done by email. Yeah, absolutely. And the report, uh, NRC reports aren't public either before they're approved. Yeah, that's true. And right. go that's through true. peer review and approved by the panel and everyone's happy. Yeah. And the reviewers are named. NRC, they the are reports. yes. So, yeah. so it, it's but you have to ask another, them beforehand yes. to make sure that well, you're yeah, going to have yeah. It. You just need to know in advance. And are their comments going to be made public after the fact, or at least FOIable? Well, I don't think the comments, but I think the fact you name the peer reviewers is okay. Fine. 
I mean, you have to define it. You have to define a protocol. Yeah. And I think just call the NRC because those guys know what they're doing. My concern is the timing still, because it seems to me on the phthalates NRC, that took the whole summer. If I remember correctly. And, I, and it was sure a beautiful summer. Mm. Sorry? <laughs> it was a beautiful summer. <laughs> yes, it took time, but I think it's worth it. And, and we, can, we can impose timelines, deadlines, etc. Do you have a major problem with that, Chris? I'm just concerned about, you know, if, if, if this backs us up to say we need a final report now by December, I'm not sure we're, yeah. I'm not sure we're set to do that. If we have until February, maybe that's better. If we have until, you know, so it's the timing part, because the whole thing has to be done by April. Is that right? That's the deadline. Um, I think a draft report by February would probably allow for peer review still meet the deadline that nicely gets us into the next topic which Bern yeah. is going to, to chair and, and that's how we're going to get to the final product and I think we need to have some serious discussion about about that we're thank you Phil I think it has become a little less clear in my mind now than I had before this discussion about peer review uh, let's work backward from April until now and see what we have to do in the next three meetings. And then we can try to fit peer review in there or not. I'm assuming that today we're going, today and tomorrow, we're going to be talking more than we have in the, in the past about use of the exposure data and we're going to talk more about hazard index. And we're going to, one by one, touch on the various components of the, of the report to just check progress on these and see how they're fitting together. And see if by the end of tomorrow's meeting, we have identified some gaps that we need to fit yet into this or if we're satisfied that it's coming together in the pieces that we have already had prog progress working on. So I, I see this as still kind of a relaxed meeting in terms of timing to be able to talk about process and product to some extent and to hear updates. So that's kind of my vision of what today and tomorrow will be. I think by November we need to start talking about what are the recommendations that we're going to make to CPSC. So we will have the results of the exposure information, we'll have the results of the hazard index work, and the rest of the information from the human epidemiology, from the animal studies, reproductive and developmental in both species, will continue to be filled in. And if you need additional information on no whales or whatever, we can continue to, to work those out, but I think by November, and we have tentatively agreed on November 3 and 4 as the next meeting, <clears throat> I think we need to begin to come to grips with recommendations because we're running out of time and we have to compress this effort of evaluation that we've been in to ask what specifically are we going to recommend on the phthalates that are already restricted and regulated, and those that are alternates, and those that are out there without much review or regulation. So I would hope that a, a work piece on the table next time would perhaps be a draft of some recommendations. And we may have to have a subcommittee of this committee get together, at least by telephone, to think about structuring that, to get a framework for that, so that it isn't going to be just one person's opinion by November. But that's what I would see for the November meeting. Then if we stick to this timing, we would have another meeting in January and February, January, February timeframe. So 
one more meeting before the final one in April. So in January and February, we, we would perhaps finalize what we think our recommendations should be to CPSC. So we will have discussed them in the November meeting and argue if need be what they, what the, they might be, but then have another chance to think about it for a couple of months and in January or February be prepared to either buy into or fail to reach agreement on what those recommendations might be. So then we have to have more writing assignments to have a document that perhaps we could look at by January and February. The parts from Russ and Phil and I can hopefully be pretty much finished by that time. But the, the, the final thing that's going to tie into the recommendations is the work that the rest of you are doing mm -hmm. that's going to give us the basis for saying, well, here are the three reasons why we should restrict this one, or here are the two reasons why we shouldn't restrict that one, kind of things. So I think that will all have to fit together by, by the end of the February meeting so that perhaps we would have an interim, an intermediate deadline for a draft report that we could review before the April meeting. So then in April, what would be left would be one last shot at saying, do we agree or disagree with our own recommendations? And the report would have been fleshed out to the extent that we would be able to leave that behind as well. There will be final touch-ups that have to be done in wording, but not in concept. So we don't have to have we don't have to have something that we're prepared to sign at the end of the April meeting, but we have to be in agreement of what it says, as revised, and then it can be put into final form. And Mike, I'm not sure what the final process for CPSC is to get agreement of all the committee members on a doc on a document. Maybe you can comment on that. Well, in the past, there's been a, a signature sheet. Um, I don't know uh, if we're, um, you know, doing the final editing and so on. Um, I don't know if, how we would address that exactly, but, you know, FedEx a, yeah. around or whatever, That's we'll worry about that. So then how do we retrofit a peer review into this? Conceptually, I agree with a peer review, but I'm afraid it might take us for sure one meeting. It might lengthen this, this process by one meeting, if not two. Because for us to gather the information and discuss it, I'm, I, would, I would assume that the information that we will get back will be fairly voluminous. It, it won't be measured in a few pages. It'll be measured maybe in inches <laughs> that we might get back on this. Although this will be, the, this open comment period is strictly for those, that handful of reviewers. It's not for everybody. Okay, so that should cut it down from inches to maybe half inches. But we, it'll, it'll still take us some time to discuss the concept behind some of these recommendations for change and whether or not we want to engage in that. So I don't think that's a one hour discussion. And whether we are prepared to ask CPSC if, we're, if we can go from April to July for the last meeting or maybe September, that's the consequence of extending this through that period of time. That, that can be determined only by Mike and his colleagues within CPSC. Andreas. But what's the final deadline according to the law? Well, it's, it's two years. Um, uh, the first meeting was, I think, on the April 14th. Uh, I, I think your appointments were officially like the 12th or 13th. So it would be mid-April 2012 is the official deadline. If we go beyond that, we would have to ask the commission for permission to do that. And that's usually not a problem because 
um, you know, if the report's not done, not quite done, it's not quite done. Um, but could we not argue we we are still sort of within the spirit of the law if we get, uh, according to Bernie's timetable, the report finalized by by April well, I think with final touches and then add the peer review process on? Well, in that, in that case, it would still, I mean, it wouldn't be final. So technically, we would still, yeah, it might be the spirit, but technically, we would have to uh, hmm. still have to ask for an extension. Would you see that as a problem? Uh, no, because I think it would be a, a defined period yeah. of time. Yeah. Well, the alternative is to get ready with, with the final report, final for peer review by the January-February meeting, and then submit it to peer review and limit it to an April meeting and then finalize. I don't know how feasible this is, but I think. If we plan to have a version that's ready for peer review after the February meeting, presumably after the February meeting, we would somebody would have to do some cleanup. You know, not changing of the report, but just typing things that we suggest to be revised. So you're talking the middle of February, if we have the meeting early in February before the copy would go to the peer reviewers, and if we give them what's the normal thing for a peer reviewer, 60 days, maybe? I think we would probably got, want to do less than that. So maybe 30 to 60 days, 45 days, something in there. Then the April meeting in our part would, we don't have, we wouldn't have a chance to second guess our recommendations because they would have already been out there for peer review. But we could, we could use the April meeting to discuss the comments that we got from the peer reviewers and thereby hold this to a one meeting extension, not a, not a two meeting extension. But that cuts our time a little bit short for being able to formulate recommendations, think about it for a couple of months, think about the implications of those recommendations and then bring them up again to, to discuss, now what do we, we, this time we have to make a decision. Last time we just talked about it. Now that we've thought about it, let's make a decision today. That may be a luxury that we don't need or can't afford, I don't know. It's, it's my sense that you would favor the your, your original suggestion to have, have the final touch up, the final report in the April meeting, then ask for an extension for peer review and then implement the peer review results. I don't know, Andreas, I hadn't tried to weigh the, okay. the risk. It's a risk risk decision. Mm. Because our recommendations are going to be out there forever. And I sure would hate to have been part of this committee and have a final report out there that we wish we had had one more shot at discussing the recommendations. I think that, in my mind, is probably more important than a voluntary peer review. But if, if our recommendations gel very easily without much concern beyond, you know, for further discussion, much need for further discussion, well, then the, we won't need that time. I, I, I don't assume that we're going to fall into recommendations without much discussion. I think it'll take some time to work it through so that we certain that we really agree with these recommendations as opposed to a last minute effort before we ran to the airport. I agree with you. I think we should have maximum time for this. So let's finalize the, the I, I, I agree with your suggestion. Let's finalize the report at an April meeting and then then see how peer review ties in. That this gives us maximum time. Okay. Now, um, a lot of the you know editing within the committee. I mean, you can re all review each other's chapters and do a lot of editing um, online. I mean, by email. So that will um, help to get the report ready sooner 
and that's probably something we should be starting to do pretty soon is, is seriously reading the different chapters or whenever you think it's, they're ready, uh, start reviewing them and sending comments. One lesser important consideration, this report should be as long as it needs to be. And I don't have in mind a, a goal of having a 100-page report or 150-page report. I think it needs to be as long as it needs to be, but it, so, some reports <clears throat> seem to be a lot longer than they would need to be <laughs> from the past. And it takes a long time to write that extra material and to review it and to reach agreement on it. And sh what discipline should we put on ourselves to have these reports be minimalist versus longer than minimalist? How, 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 how brief do we want this to be? Or how lengthy do we want it to, to, to be? I mean, that's a, that's a question I think we each have to ask in terms of our, our writing assignments and what the purpose is. Uh, for example, on what I'm writing on the, on the developmental toxicology, what is the, what is the purpose of that section? And as I initially started writing it, I assumed that it was to thoroughly analyze the, the in vivo developmental tox literature with the idea of establishing the most credible Noels for the most sensitive endpoints that Chris and, and Holger would be able to use in their hazard index analysis. If that's the case, then you know that my section has to have a fairly uh, uh, thorough analysis of, of that literature in, in the text so that people who read it will know how we generated those, those Noels. Uh, if that's not the case, then that section can be a whole lot shorter. Well, I think not only is it a matter of what are the Noels for those endpoints, but that's where people are going to look for what really is the phthalate syndrome and what species does it involve and what credibility does this observation have for human risk. And as a result, I think your section on developmental toxicology is far more important than my section on reproductive toxicology because they're the effects on sperm count or sperm motility or whatever that might define a noel for a reproductive study is of secondary importance compared to that nest of responses that we consider to be the phthalate syndrome. Mm -hmm. So yours has to be as complete as it needs to be so that that doesn't get second guessed. I think on my part, if, if there are some subtleties that people agree or disagree with, uh, it isn't near as important as whether or not we missed something on, on a phthalate response. And for the human data, obviously the question behind this whole exercise is, is there any evidence in humans of, the, of a phthalate syndrome equivalent? And then we have to have as many pages as it takes to address the integrity of the information from humans about a phthalate syndrome. And based on that conclusion, what it means that this is primarily a change that occurs in rats to a lesser extent in other species. And the risk of making a risk decision based on one species when you have some data that shows that, that the same thing doesn't happen in mice and rabbits and marmosets to the same extent. So here's a one, one species change that's driving a risk decision for humans. We have to bridge all of that. So I would hope that our space in writing would be taken for making those kinds of, for bringing that kind of information forward. Yeah. And, and the reason I bring this up is I think when we discuss our individual sections, which we're going to do, well, it's on the schedule for this afternoon. I, I, I hope that each of you have read the, uh, the, the updates that were, were sent around uh, because I, for one, would like your comments about 
how I put it together, is that the most appropriate way to put it together? Have I missed something? Uh, have I been in error uh, in what I've written? These are the kinds of comments I would like to receive, and I'd like, I think everybody around the table would like to, to receive those kinds of comments, because the, the sooner we get those comments, make those changes, I think, the sooner we can put the sections together and have, you know, a, a draft document of the entire uh, document that we were eventually going to send around for peer review. I think a more important question than how long should the report be is what we put into the front of the report versus what we put in appendices. Because if we have a long flowing document without appendices, it's going to be a lot to work through. Whereas if we can capture important points in the upfront part of the report, but put the data slogging parts in appendices, that might make it a lot more readable. And for, for mine, for instance, I'm, I'm going to have quite a few tables. I'm going to discuss in, in words the various in vivo studies, but then have tables that sub summarize those. Would those be best in, in with the text, or would those be better in, in the appendices? That's the kind of decisions that I think as a committee we need to, to make. Uh, since, since we were talking about sections of the, the report, one of the sections which is not listed really is the conclusions and recommendations and the process for putting that together. I know it'll be a, you know, a, a group project and decision, but most likely one or two people will take the lead in writing that. So not that we need to decide that now, but I think we should during this meeting in terms of the process for the overall conclusions and recommendations, how we'll put that on paper. Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, let me just look at my outline here that Yeah, I think, no, it's not, but I think um, that's something that uh, Byrne and I said we would take a, yes, take a stab at and then um, get input from the committee. So what do you think would be the timing of that? I mean, you probably can't write or put thoughts down until the November meeting, or possibly after this meeting between now and then? I'm not sure, because that, that really will be a, a critical part of the report for us yeah. to have time to. Well, one, I would hope, for example, um, it, I, I've read the update from Chris and, and Holger, and the, the one part that's not there is their summary. <laughs> and had that been there, I would feel much better about beginning to write that conclusion. <laughs> so if, if in our discussions today, those kinds of things begin to emerge, then I would feel better about making a, beginning a draft. Likewise, if, I, if what Paul tells us today uh, begins to give me some framework in terms of exposure scenarios and how that's going to play into our conclusions and our recommendations, then I, I think uh, Bern and I could begin to start writing that. But right now, I don't have any of that, so. Um, as far as the exposure goes, um, in May, uh, we developed a bunch of scenarios that we thought would be reasonable to consider. And since then, um, Versar has been gathering data, putting it into tables, categorizing it. This summer, we expect to see the results of their analysis for exposure, which would be kids' toys versus food versus anything else we can find that would be reasonable. Uh, once that's done, and I think what will have ha happen is that the material will trickle in over time uh, this summer. It should be then taken over and given it to Holger and Chris to see how, you know, 
they want to compare it to uh, the in daily intakes they've been um, estimating um, with the biomarker data because that will be a real crucial set of analyses before anyone can write a summary. Otherwise, the summary will just be based upon biomarker data, and I don't think that that's sufficient when you're trying to consider the children's toy issue or those issues that may, in fact, impact uh, uh, pregnancy uh, in, in a woman. So I think that's where the whole, it's not a hold up, but that's where the process is going. It's, it takes a lot of work. The final report, I think, will be a lot of tables in the appendix with crucial data and analyses that have been done to select the scenarios that were most appropriate being used um, as part of the text. So that's where I think it, it's going to fall. And when do you envision that you know, the text part, the, the summary, the, the nuggets, are going to be available. Any idea? Once, once the analyses are finished, we're going to get a, a summary this afternoon of where they are, mm -hmm. and then once we get a summary of where they are based upon the charge we gave them, we'll be able to give you a more, a better, clearer picture. I would say the fall would be more logical. They, their annual, their report, their final report, is due in January on the whole analysis, but the results should be available within October. I'm not sure that's sufficient time for the you know, current status of the November meeting, but that's the way the contract was written by CPSC. Is that a fair way of describing it? Yeah, and it's, it's really what they can, they're working, they understand that we need this as fast as possible. They sure do. And they're working uh, hard on it. It's also a case where you know, there's a lot of sort of groundwork, and once they get that done, then the rest is easier. Chris and, and Holt, where do you see your analyses uh, standing at this point? I mean, how much, what are you waiting for, if anything, to push your analysis further? Or do you see that you've pretty much done as much as you can? And where are you? Um, good question. I think um, there's still, you know, the opportunity. Uh, Holger has a, some additional um, values that we should consider. Um, I think, you know, I have tried to implement some of the new uh, reference doses that tables put. Maybe, maybe there was an update that needs to, you know, so there's some yeah, that, around with that. Yeah. yeah, that will change as I develop the developmental tox ones, I think, because that's the ones I think we want to use rather than the, the reproduct, reprotox Noels. So. That's something we need to discuss at some point. But once you have those, uh, what else would you? I think with the structure, we are pretty confident that we have really reached the, the, the final structure of our chapter. And we will do some minor modifications in terms of conversion factors and uh, and points of departure. Some recent literature came out. Uh, but that's very easy to modify. Yeah. And as you said, uh, we haven't yet <laughs> written the final conclusion. But I think in a way, although the ch our chapter is independent from what is Paul working on, I would prefer at least to have a first impression of what result he comes to because mm -hmm. although our, our chapters are separate from each other, we mm -hmm. cannot po pinpoint uh, exposure to the source. So I would, in my conclusion, in the conclusion of our chapter, prefer to have a first impression on the findings of Paul and, and, and the Versa approach. Mm -hmm. And I think your chapter, Paul, will also be quite an extensive one. It Mostly 
mostly in the appendix because there's a lot of analysis. Yeah, but I would like to see have the, the approach is fixed. I would like to see yeah, the that will be part of it. Yes, that, that needs to be. That will be part. They have to write a full report and then include the approaches used, the approaches we defined, how we got to where the decision. Absolutely, it has to be part. So, uh, an interesting um, little rub here could end up being if if your estimates for daily intakes are much different than than real. ours, then I think we're going to really have to address that. Yes, mm -hmm. that, that's that's the main issue is where they they fall because biomarker data. We're going to be doing exposure construction. We're going to try to estimate children's toy conditions and then exposure issues based upon how kids touch, use, suck, and track material. Those all will determine the kind of percentage. You will actually come up with Number. estimates of yeah. daily intake, right? Yeah. Per chemical, per valley. Uh, for ones, there's, there's data. There are, and then we'll try to use analogs for others, but that's the rub is where the, the data is. Now there is there is a question there, and we're, we're going to be grappling this for a while. Is is is, is uh, pregnant mother issue? How that you know what her intake is, how it affects the fetus, uh, and there are a couple of things we'll be talking about this afternoon, a little bit dicey, but may have some ramifications also that we haven't really in a group thought about before, but we thought about in May. So we'll leave that one for this afternoon. Um, I wonder how. <coughs> sorry, it's a bit loud. Um, the what what you come up with as estimates for NOELs, if you want to use that term, or or points of departure, will also impact on what Chris and Holger do. But from what I've seen, one um, result of that analysis is that the impact is not very big because the uh, numerator of these terms exposure varies so much. And that, I will certainly have that information available well before the next meeting that I can get to you. I should have had that done already, but I, I don't. In terms of timing, <clears throat> I think it sure would be great if we could have the answer index process taken as far as we can get it by November. And if we can have the opportunity to not wait for the, a report from Versar until January to have these two pieces be the substance of our time in November so that we see how these two fit together. Because if we wait until January, we may have the same problem. If we wait for the report and it comes out mm -hmm. towards the end of January, we're not even going to have a meeting in mm -hmm. January, February. And we're looking at extending this process quite a few months, even without doing a peer review. So if if we could get the exposure data and the hazard index information to work together for a November meeting, that would allow us to begin to talk about recommendations then in that November meeting. So is that possible, Paul? It's, I'm handicapped by Versar. Say yes, sure, but my yeah, handicap is the does these calculations, which should be relatively easy once they finish developing the scenarios around which we described it, well, which we set up in April, in May. All dependent upon that. But at, at today's meeting, Paul, you could go over what the objectives were of the exposure assessment and what some of the input pieces are and expected outputs without anything quantitative but at least letting us know. That's what the presentation this afternoon should be covering. Okay. All right. Correct? Correct. Well, yeah, I have, by the way, I haven't seen the pre presentation. I'm a little distraught. It was supposed to be done beginning of July. And so, therefore, I'm worried about Versa's ability to make a deadline if they weren't able to get something to me by the beginning of July. So, right now, I'm a bit frustrated because I haven't seen the darn thing. You'll see it. Yes. Well, I will learn what you'll learn at the same time. Okay, so 
it's not without pressing these people that they haven't done it. So it's a little disconcerting because if we have to meet a deadline, they have to ramp up their activities. This needs to be a, a really um, deep discussion between Kristen Holger and, and, and Paul and, and Versar this afternoon. I think that's the key component that, that's going to play into what progress we make in, in, in November yeah. and beyond. So I think the other components, Russ's component, uh, Burns, mine, uh, Andreas, uh, we'll, we'll have those essentially um, drafts by, by November. And then we can just tweak those with any data that comes in subsequently. But uh, your two components are in flux in, until we get uh, Paul's. Okay, Burn. I'd like to revisit the question of peer review, external peer review, for another minute. Because I, th I think if we are going to request an additional an extension we the sooner we can do it mm -hmm. the better yeah. and if if we commit to external peer review today I think we need to ask CPSC for at least one more meeting beyond what we have scheduled to do that and that's a, about a three month period we're talking about being done by July August rather than April and if we don't do external peer review, we may, we may still need that meeting, but it's, it's, we don't know that now. We may know more by tomorrow, but um, I, I think if we, are, if we want to commit to an external, if we want to request CPSC to have an external peer review done, I think it would be helpful if we made that decision and that recommendation today. Or, well, either today or before we convene, or before uh, we adjourn tomorrow. Yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's what I meant by today. Yeah. Well, what's the ramifications if we request now and we don't need it? Well, I think I would probably not put forward the request until we get closer to the deadline. So what? So basically, what you need is an affirmation that if we need it, we want to request it. That's that's basically what it comes down to. If you if we're not going to put it in now, we're going to wait. Yeah, Instead I mean, I would to another around. Of, you know, do you guys agree that we should have an extension? We say yes in principle, and if in fact we need it, you pick the date. Yeah, and and you're going to submit the request. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll find out how much lead time. Need and I suspect there are people in CPSC who are asking, Mike, are you going to be done in April or not? And these are the oh. budget people. They need to know. Well, I mean, it's not just the bu budget people, but, uh, you know, people want to know. Sure. But, uh, you know, we're talking about a, a couple of, it's not unusual for something yes. like this to be a couple months right. late. But But just to come back to the exposure part, in tab six, there's a copy of the, the work plan. Uh, gives the chemicals and the mm -hmm. kinds of things that we're looking at. That's at the, at, it's the, I think the end of tab six. So we decided on there's, a, I think, eight phthalates. Right. Um, which reflects its combination of what <coughs> is the ones that we think are important and the ones for which there are data. Right. You know, the funny thing is what's the chemicals that you find in the biomonitoring studies is 
not entirely the same set that you can find exposure data for and so on. Fluid situation. Yeah. Which is not unusual because the purposes of the biomonitoring is X and purposes of exposure assessment are usually required by Y right. and they've never been done simultaneously because they weren't part of a consistent study design or regulatory process. So the fact that there are differences uh, in terms of the types and the varieties of, of data okay. is not is not to be surprising to anyone. But are there examples in which both were done? Biomonitoring and exposure assessments? And children? Huh. In any in any scenario. I'm just getting at you know, what kind of agreement or disagreement are there between the two methods? I mean, yeah, the only one I know is a Wormuth's paper. Yeah, but that's... That's the only example. Anyway, I'm, I'm told that because this is a congressional, uh, congressionally mandated deadline that we might not have the flexibility um, we're not sure what the process would be, so I'll have to find out more about that. By extending? So that would have an impact on yeah. whether we get peer review or not. Well, if in fact there's no flexibility, then I th think we need to think in terms of meetings at shorter interval than three months to get this done. But s somehow we have, we have to focus our attention to get it done by April if that's the case. Mm -hmm. So it may require instead of a meeting, talk to a a meeting in November and another one in January, February. We may need to have one in between there. Mike, would you be able to determine that while we're at this meeting, oh, what the situation is? I can ask. Any other uh, input? <clears throat> well, oh, <laughs> yeah, the sky's the limit. Okay, well, um, the rest of the, the meeting was to be spent going over uh, the various sections. And uh, so I think we've, we've finished the agenda for, for this morning. We might as well launch into uh, the afternoon's agenda. And, and Paul will have to wait on yours because Versar is not, not here. Versar is uh, not here yet. Well, no, Versar and Matt are going to be here after first thing after lunch. Right, so we'll so have to wait. We'll do that when it first thing after lunch. Um, and Andreas has uh, agreed to begin a discussion of, of his section on mixtures and cumulative exposures. Okay, this is. Um, Shall I briefly talk to it, uh, talk you through it? Um, this is 
This material was essentially uh, thoroughly reviewed already for the um, NRC report 2008. So what I've done is essentially an update of that because that was necessary because um, since publication of the NRC report, quite a few other experimental studies have appeared in the literature. But just to summarize it briefly for you, um, the situation is very similar to that with the study of individual phthalates. The rat was selected as the, um, the model for study. And so it is not surprising that almost all mixture studies have been conducted with the rat. Um, I've structured this in, uh, in the following way. First of all, I've summarized evidence, experimental empirical evidence, uh, to show combination effects between various phthalates. And there's a very recent study has just come out. Olga has distributed it by um, our Grace group. And then secondly, evidence to support the notion that there's also combination effects between phthalates and other antiandrogens. It has to be acknowledged that a lot of the efforts in that area of study were devoted to asking or answering the question uh, which of the two competing models, independent action or dose addition, is best for approximating experimentally observed mixture effects. And the answer seems to be it is um, dose addition, which is good and has relevance uh, in relation to the um, hazard index approach exercised by, by Chris and Holger. So there's strong evidence in the experimental literature to support the notion that dose addition is the concept that approximates best the experimentally observed effects, both of phthalate mixtures and of mixtures of phthalates with other antiandrogens. So really, that in a nutshell is, is a summary of this. Um, it, it is of note that a couple of quite important studies appeared after 2008, after the NRC report. There's one paper by Christian Natal, which also carries my name on it, where some synergisms were observed, but also additivity, and then further work from uh, Earl Grace group. Andreas? Yeah. So if it's dose addition, is it dose addition without any qualifier as to quantity, or how does one do that? It is dose addition, but what happens is, um, you know, these are concepts. Uh, mixture toxicology has one goal, uh, always had one, uh, and that is how can we, or can we indeed, anticipate the effects of mixtures uh, mm -hmm. from the toxicity of uh, its individual components? Can we make predictions when the mixture effects are not known? Mm -hmm. So the you always start off with the effects you observe with the individual chemicals and you select one endpoint for study. Right. And in this case, in this experimental literature, for example, for phthalates, the uh, most sensitive endpoint in the rat has always been selected and that is suppression of fetal androgen synthesis. Mm -hmm. So you measure this for each individual component, you construct those response relationships, mm -hmm. which you then utilize to plug them into the dose addition concept to make a prediction of the joint effect of a mixture with defined composition. And then you ask the question, do the experimentally observed values agree with this prediction? Often, often it is amazingly accurate, sometimes not so. But uh, in this literature side by side, the uh, predictions generated by using the concept of independent action were also compared. And, there's one uh, strong thread coming through, and that is that independent action, or as it's here sometimes called response addition, consistently underestimates the experimentally observed mm. mixture effect. So, so dose addition is really a good, good way of approximating the experimentally observed values. Mm 
Yes, there's one point to add. Um, what requires consideration is the potential for effects to occur that deviate from your additivity expectation, for example, synergisms or antagonisms. Antagonisms haven't really been observed much in this, in this area, but um, there are indications of synergistic interactions when you, when you choose penile malformations as the endpoint for, for analysis. Um, that came up in, the, um, in our paper, Christiansen et al., and uh, we've been puzzled by this. We cannot offer a mechanistic explanation for it because the, all the other endpoints in that same study, uh, typical of all marks of se sexual differentiation in the male, were all conforming with, with dose addition. Only hyperspadias, penile malformations, did not. And there are echoes of that and some hints in various papers from, uh, from Earl Gray's group and Cynthia Ryder, Cynthia Ryder being the first author. The problem with these data by Cynthia Ryder et al. is um, it's difficult to conclusively analyze it because there are a couple of provisors, the data they use to construct their um, predictions come from historical databases where, where the exposure regimen adopted uh, for the mixture isn't exactly the same as for the single chemical, so that complicates the analysis a little. But there are hints, and this would require attention. So, so basically this analysis of the literature would, uh, if you like, provide the foundation for the um, hazard index analysis uh, conducted by, by Chris and, and Holger. It actually exposes one gap or one difficulty, and that is the, the experimental literature suggests there's clearly the potential for uh, phthalates to interact with other antiandrogens, but this knowledge cannot easily be taken forward in the, um, into the hazard index analysis because often we, we lack the exposure information for, for the other antiandrogens. That is a problem. It has an impact ultimately, in my opinion, on this hazard index analysis, um, you know, in the sense that you probably have to be a little flexible with um, the interpretation. For example, if the hazard index approaches one, and this is based only by considering phthalates, you, you have to take into account the uh, the background exposure to other agents and bear this in mind and probably not get too hung up about number one being exceeded or if it ends up around one. You want to take into account that exposure in reality is to a lot of other antiandrogens as well. And a special issue, um, that's more recent uh, evidence from Earl Grey's lab, that is the interaction between phthalates and TCDD with these endpoints. TCDD itself doesn't induce the typical spectrum of the phthalate syndrome, but uh, the indications are that it can exacerbate the effects of phthalates. So that, that's quite important as well. Andreas, oh, I guess so. Go ahead. Um, no, they rarely speculate. <laughs> Andreas, so. If you're saying that something approaches one, you have to use a degree of caution, especially if we're doing these added doses and the fact that there are other backgrounds. So when do we get concerned? When does the hazard index begin to rise to the level that we think that it's real for the phthalates we're under consideration? Because that weigh heavily on where we go over in terms of our conclusions and recommendations. Well, you're asking me, uh, in essence, how long a piece of string is, but all well, I can, <laughs> I'm happy to answer. <laughs> <laughs> all I can say is, for example, if you, if you end up with a hazard index of around 0.8, yeah, just below one, sure. then 
you have to exercise caution uh, if you then want to blow the trumpet, oh, there's nothing, uh, no case to answer. But uh, anything else is very difficult to quantify simply because we are lacking the, the exposure situa um, information. So what if it goes to 1.2? Well, the same same problem. With phthalates alone to 1.2, then according to the premises of deterministic risk assessment, you are, would have to say two things. Either you want to stop and then say, okay, we have to do something in terms of exposure reduction, mm -hmm. or you want to refine your analysis if this is possible. Okay. But often yeah. that's not possible. Right. At least you're giving me some boundary conditions to, yeah. to think about it, and which I think is important for the whole committee. Yeah. The, the last points you make, Andreas, uh, remind me that in each of the sections that we write, uh, it would be helpful for, for Byrne and, and for myself if you would identify issues like this that need to be included in uh, a summary statement, for example in our document. Yeah, I haven't done that yet, but I will, yes. Okay. And that's for all of us to do that. I say this in the past, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but when we begin to talk about other anti-androgens, it seems to me that there's a box. Um, to address how big that box actually could be without actually having a number, but it, I mean, it, that is a very big box, right? There are a lot of other anti-androgens mm -hmm. that potentially could have a, an increase, a combination effect with the phthalates. Um, I don't know how to yeah, Yes, that we're, we're so. venturing in the territory of Rumsfeldian known unknowns here. That, that's the problem. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. um, this is, this is quite frankly an area that requires more research. Uh, the, the scientific, uh, if you look at the scientific literature, what scientists like to do is uh, to use certain chemicals as tools to clarify mechanisms, to clarify phenomena. Mm -hmm. And the selection of tested chemicals there is therefore biased. It doesn't necessarily reflect what is really out there and what perhaps should be studied. That, that is a problem, but we can't. We have to deal with it pragmatically because we can't reinvent the wheel here. So, Chris, in answer to your question, well, you remember in the NRC report there was a list of, of substances potentially deep to be considered in this. This included a couple of pesticides, but also other, other more persistent chemicals. Uh, I would like to mention the polybrominated uh, diphenyl ethers, the dioxin type uh, contaminants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a whole host. But again, as we have found in our hazard index paper, which I some time ago uh, presented here, um, you know, the what this analysis shows more than anything else is, is in fact the data gaps. Mm -hmm. But there we are. We need to therefore exercise caution in interpreting a hazard index based solely on joint exposures to certain phthalates. Any other comments? Okay, I suggest that we take a uh, short break. Reconvene at um, you know, quarter to eleven. Okay, I'd like to reconvene the chat committee, please. <clears throat> and uh, what I'd like to do now is to have the committee uh,
go to uh, tab eight in their uh, workbook. I wanted to uh, go through uh, my section on, on developmental toxicity and I'm not going to read it word for word, but just to go through the sections and uh, get your input. Uh, what I decided to do uh, is to start off with um, start off the uh, discussion with a um, an introduction, and in the first section, uh, have a, uh, a few paragraphs on on male sexual differentiation in mammals, and and essentially what I did. Um, was was to take this verbatim from the uh, um, the NRC publication that that we given a copy of. Um, I don't know whether that's uh, something we we want to do or, but I I felt just as I was writing it, why reinvent the wheel? They had a nice concise summary of it, and why rewrite it using words that probably were less uh, succinct. So that's what I did. I thought that was important to have that somewhere in the document, since we're going to be referring to that uh, quite frequently. So any, any comments about the doing that? And is that extensive enough? Holger? I think that's a great summary. We don't have to reinvent the beat again, and uh, the, the the NAS report is perfect this way, and the way you excerpted it, it, it that's just perfect. Okay. <coughs> then the, the I, I agree. Yeah. Okay. The second uh, section is where I describe the the rat uh, phthalate syndrome. Uh, I, I thought that obviously needed to be. Uh, described in some detail, and uh, I think we only need to probably have that in there once, uh, and then we can all refer to it. So does anybody have any any comments about what I've put there? I've tried to be quite concise. Uh, if you don't have comments uh, at, at the moment, please uh, submit them to me uh, after the fact. Not only did I, I put in the, um, the obvious uh, outward signs of the rat phthalate syndrome, but also uh, linked uh, those mechanistically to what was going on uh, at the biochemical levels, gene expression levels. And also what I've, what I've done all through my document is given references right at the end of each section, and, and we have to decide at some point how we're going to deal with references. Um, uh, can I make one comment about the um, sure. page five, uh, the top, where you end uh, summarizing the study by McKinnell et al. of the Marmoset? Um, probably we have to build on, on the entire discussion of about that, but could you perhaps add, add or stress that the measurements of testosterone were conducted at birth? Yes, after your, after yeah. your comments earlier, yes. Yeah. And if you did the same with the rat, you wouldn't see anything either. Right, and that, that section three then is, is the, the phthalate syndrome in other species excluding humans. Um, and I think I've captured uh, the literature there, but if, if anyone knows of any other um, references that I should uh, cite, I, I'd like to know that. 
Chris? Um, maybe I'm, I'm reading quickly, but um, uh, just the importance of what a, that the fact that it is a syndrome and on a particular, on a, on a, in a given study, if you look at a single endpoint part of that syndrome, you may actually miss the more strength of it as a syndrome. Like the phenotypic response on a given animal may not show so all the, of the, uh, you yes. know what I mean? So yes. that, um, you need to make that clear up front, I think. That not all features are seen in any one study. That by taking it as a, as a group, one or the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure people analyze the data that way. So it's. And, I, and I'd be happy if, if you email me verbiage that you particularly like. I'd be happy to consider that. Okay, and the mechanism of, oh, Bern? The fact that in your title of number three <clears throat> on this page four brings attention to the fact that you're excluding humans suggests that it's someplace else. Mm -hmm. There must be a parallel discussion about what the phthalate syndrome looks like in humans. And yes, and, and right, that's a good point. To, that I would assume would come in Russ's section where yeah, he. It's, it's not currently there. Um, it's, well, I guess when we, we get to the human data, we can discuss there's the testicular genesis syndrome, yes. which may be a counterpart, but the level of human data is very limited in relation to that endpoint or that syndrome, TDS. Yeah. But I, I would think at some point you'd, you'd want to discuss specifically what the testicular dysgenesis syndrome is in humans, what the features of it are, and then you know, relate that to the, you know, the rat phallic Yeah, there, there's a, uh, when we go through it, there's very little in there now, but I could definitely expand yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, That'd be a nice connection to, to make. One thing that I am not sure we had in our outline to begin with was I mean we need this section on the human syndrome. It isn't a phthalate syndrome, but it is the, as close as we come to it with what little information there is. But someplace in here there has to be a visible discussion about based on what we know in humans and based on what we know about this one species response in the rat that we call the phthalate syndrome, what, what does that lead us to conclude about risk to humans? We have to have that discussion in here someplace. Yeah, and I think that's going to come <coughs> at the end, I would think. Yeah. But we, we, that's another thing that we need to put in the parking lot to make sure that we don't forget later on when we're writing the discussion. Okay. Because if, if we fail to do that, the rat data stand on their own, and readers will wonder, well, why do they have all that rat data when they don't talk about it in terms of the human risk? Um, Mike, are you taking notes? <coughs> Could you put that down in, in our parking lot of yes ideas that we want to include in the my section, which I'll I'll highlight. But literally, it's just a few lines. But it's trying to to do what what Bernie said is basically take the human findings and put it in the context of what we see in rats, the phthalate syndrome. And just to step back <coughs> for a second out of context of this to pick up something else and put it in the parking lot that we talked about earlier this morning, and that was w we said there was a need to have additional information on antiandrogens in combination beyond phthalates. And how big is that box? And how important might it be? Or how <coughs> unimportant might it be? I think that's another parking lot issue that we need to have in the discussion mm -hmm. someplace. Mm -hmm. And Andreas, I didn't have a chance to really look carefully at your document. How much discussion, if any, do you have on antiandrogens in your? It's a separate chapter, phthalates in combination with other antiandrogens. And, and uh, there's quite a few studies uh, published in the peer-reviewed literature now which, which I've summarized. Okay. So it is definitely an issue to be taken forward. 
and it can be easily done. Okay. Russ, do you have a comment? Yeah, I were you going to go on, I, I guess, to section four? But I had a, yeah. a question about whether, because I haven't looked through everything you've written uh, either, but in, in terms of differences in metabolism across species, where would that come into the document? Good point. Um, Cover that a little bit in mind, but not very extensively. Yeah, that's well. It, the next it, section is <coughs> mechanism of action. That really isn't metabolism because it's um, relevant. I think it's to very the relevant. Marmoset. Yeah, and I think that discussion <coughs> about <coughs> species differences in metabolism or similarities yes. between phthalates in metabolism is important in the context of which of those metabolites might account for the biological effect yes. in that species. So all of that needs to be brought together. Yep, I'm going to have to add a section. would have counterparts where you'd have metabolism in rats, other species, and then humans. So would you cover the metabolism in humans or would that more easily be done altogether with rats and mice and whatever? I haven't currently included anything on metabolism. I wasn't sure if it was going to be there's an exposure assessment section or and it's something that with Holger I think we can put into whether it goes in the epidemiologic section or <clears throat> an exposure section or standalone section. I'm not, I'm not sure. But. I'm yet not sure how deep we should get into that, what would it lead us to? Do we know really anything about differences in metabolism, species differences? And the data we are comparing, the human biomonitoring data, it's not really on the, it doesn't have to be the active metabolites, the ones that are excreted in urine. So it doesn't really tell you something about the, the metabolite levels relevant in the target tissue. Well, I was thinking of it mostly in respect to the marmoset data, but I, you know, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, it could potentially be part of a human discussion, whether it's in the epi section or another section, but it would be very brief. But I was thinking of it more as potential explanation for species differences or you know, dosing differences across spe animal species apart from human. Let me take a stab at it, and then we can see where it best fits. Holger, that sounds reasonable in terms of for, for, for relevance to the animal data, the, the metabolism. I would really keep it brief. Paul? I support Holger. I, I think I'd keep it really brief. I don't see where it's going to add that much. I'm fine with keeping it brief. I just think it needs to be there because it could potentially count for species differences in helping interpret the data. It's a lot of rudimentary data there, like metabolite levels and amniotic fluids. And we don't have much human data on that compared to some animal data. And again, I think the, the levels of metabolites in, in urine doesn't say anything about activity, if it is the active metabolites, or what is the active metabolite, and in which target organ at what time. Yeah, but uh, still, if, if, if Russ wants to discuss that in relation to possible species differences, that can be very focused. Fear, fear not. I don't feel it. No, no, it, it's perfect. It's perfect. Okay. Fair enough. <clears throat> and then mechanism of action. Um, I, I've just really briefly touched on that. That needs to be completed. Um, there's a fair bit of 
literature there in, in the rat. Um, I don't know much, I don't think there's anything in the, in the mouse or rabbit or, or marmoset that I'm aware of. Um, and so I, I plan on getting into, uh, you know, testosterone production, uh, gene expression. Um, so that'll be, that'll be summarized. And then I, I on, the, on the next page six, I started putting together a table that uh, for the different uh, uh, phthalates under consideration, uh, and then you can see that the table is not at all well spaced on the page, but what different uh, phthalates do in terms of these different endpoints. So testosterone production, uh, star mRNA, um, insulin-like factor three, CYP11A, et cetera. Um, where it's where it's known, so give us some idea of that in, in a very nicely focused. And again, we'll have to decide whether such a table is best kept right in with the text or, or put as a uh, in appendix. <coughs> and then, uh, Peter, I, yes, I I would really like to have this table in the text. That's an important table, and. Uh, of course, it can be updated with, with recent literature mm -hmm. that, that just came out. But I think this is a very important and nice table. Okay. It doesn't take up a whole lot of space and uh, easy to update. And <clears throat> um, section five, um, just the, the subject of cumulative exposures to phthalates. Um, and again, that uh, I'm not not completed. Um, can, can we not slot in there what I've written? Pardon me? Can we not slot into this what I have written, simply bump like a Lego brick, put it there? I guess we could. I guess there's no reason why we couldn't do that. Mm. Yeah. Otherwise, it would be partially redundant. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Can you think of any other uh, topics that? Uh, need to be included. The next section I go into the developmental toxicity of phthalates in, in rats. Okay, if you think of anything subsequent to the, the meeting, let me know. So where's the whole issue of antiandrogens going to be tied to us talking about it, that it's combination of factors to phthalates. Do, are we going to have some review of the anti-androgen? Yeah, that's going to be in Andreas's contribution, which is going to go in. I, I deal with them only in as and when they turn up in mixture studies, but we could, uh, yeah, I think, Chris, that's a good suggestion. It's easy to do, to have somewhere a section about what other anti-androgens do. It's a parking lot thing. You have to remember it. I, I can write that, it's no problem. Okay, that could be another uh, section right in here if we wanted it. Yeah, yeah. But very brief, Olga. Yep. <laughs> or we could put in by androgens. Um, can I make a comment about uh, page eight? Developmental toxicity phthalates in rats. You very helpfully list a, a set of criteria for what you uh, regard as an adequate uh, study for deriving a NOEL, and I agree with most of these points. But the last one, um, where you refer explicitly to OECD guideline uh, 414. Yes. This, there's a, I'm fine with that as well, only to note that 
this guideline, as far as I can see, uh, would miss out the most important endpoints for the study of developmental effects of phthalates. So they should be noted somehow. In what sense? Uh, it doesn't stipulate measuring AGD or nipple retention. Oh. You're right. Does OACD have a new protocol that includes that? It's under debate. It's the new extended one generation study, but it's not uh, sanctioned yet. It's under debate. Going back to the beginning of that section, um, so the goal is to systematically review the published peer-reviewed literature reporting the in utero exposure of phthalates in pregnant rats. Uh, then after careful consideration by the committee, this review is limited to the three permanently banned phthalates, the three phthalates currently on interim ban, and four other phthalates, DMP, DEP, P and DIBP, and I need to add a justification for the four other phthalates. We've, we've talked about why we thought uh, we needed to add these, uh, but I haven't uh, added that justification yet. And then I, I also add that because the, the first six phthalates were extensively reviewed by a phthalates expert panel in a series of reports from the NPP Center for the Evaluation of Risks to Human Reproduction in 2002. Um, our review of these phthalates begins with a brief summary of these NTP reports, which are then followed by a review of the literature since those reports. So the decision was made not to review all the individual reports prior to 2002 because that had been done beautifully by that, by those NTP committees and we felt it wasn't necessary to redo that. And so all that I have done is review the literature since that report was published. <coughs> and for the four other phthalates that were not reviewed by the NTP, uh, the following review covers all the relevant studies available uh, to the committee. And then from the available literature for these 10 phthalates, we then identified the most sensitive developmentally toxic endpoint in the particular study, as well as the lowest dose that elicited that endpoint, the NOEL. Finally, we, oh, that should be low L. Finally, we evaluated the adequacy of a particular study's NOEL in terms of our confidence in using a specific NOEL to calculate a reference dose. And that's what, uh, when I, completed this, will there be a table that I will then uh, pass on to Chris and Holger that and they will then use that in their hazard index analysis. And then that completes, I complete that section with our criteria for uh, determining an adequate study because a lot of the literature on, on phthalates um, is really mechanistic in nature, was not done to uh, determine a NOEL, yet it, I think it's important to evaluate that literature, to acknowledge that it's there, what it determined, um, but not to determine a NOEL. So just make that clear. I, I really like this, this entire structure so that you divide it between um, you know, the 2002 watershed. I like that very much. It, it's very clear. I have a couple of questions in these yeah. tables. Uh, some studies are highlighted in bold. I guess this is because you lend particular importance to those for deriving a NOEL, but, but it's nowhere stated what the 
bold means? Um, yes, I think um, in terms of that first table, your DBP. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's exactly why, and I, I didn't indicate that anywhere. That's the reason. And, and these tables are still in, in, in process. Um, and, and I need to, to modify them because um, what, I, what I've done on, on some of the tables, and you don't have copies of it, uh, when I have a Noel, what I'm doing is putting down the Noel based on what endpoint. It's not clear from this table, for example, on the Millcrest et al. 2000 study, uh, 50 milligrams per kilogram per day, it doesn't indicate on, based on what endpoint, but that will be added. Okay. So it's clear. So this, at a glance, gives you some of the important information and, and that from those criteria that I indicated in terms of an adequate study, you should be able to look across and glean from that why we either did or didn't choose a particular study uh, for consideration. Just a quick question: How you know we spoke at this? I think at the last meeting in terms of um, finding the literature. How how did you go about making sure that there aren't you know recent papers since 2002 that may have been missed? I'm asking too because for the epidemiologic literature, I've, I've been looking and um, potentially could miss a paper. So yeah. is is there have you used a systematic process? Or? Well, my, my systematic process is, is to do PubMed searches in multiple ways. Um, and I think I've captured most of the literature, but um, I, Holger and, and Andreas are going to do a backup um, for me and, and Mike as well, just to make sure I haven't, yes. And that's where, you know, potentially someone like Earl Grey or Paul Foster may be helpful. Yes. In, in making sure there aren't papers that were missed. Yeah. Paul? With, with the degree of variability in some of these studies, when do we end? Add to it, it seems like there's, there, you've done a really good job here, you know, if, if there's a one or two papers mi missing, will that influence how we look at the data? Well, I mean, I, I, I want to know when, where you end because you've done a really good job yeah. here. Well, I, I suspect that I haven't missed what I would call an adequate study. May have missed a, 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 a minor study that, that yeah. wouldn't qualify as one that I would derive a Noel from. So, but you just have to be careful where in the asymptote you want to stop. Yeah, yeah. I just I, want to make sure I haven't missed any any obvious major studies. studies. Yeah. Okay. And, and unless you know what you missed, then you can't determine its importance. Or Can I just ask a, a bigger, uh, higher level question? And that is, so it seems that you're focusing on developmental. Yes. And Burns going to focus on reproductive endpoints. Correct. Are we going to put? the two together in terms of maybe the most sensitive of the two? Good question. For combination, or are we going to do a review for developmental and reproductive and then a combination? Or what, where, what are you all thinking about? Well, Burns done a review of the reproductive, and I've done the developmental talks. And Burns developed a list of Noels for reproductive endpoints. I will develop one for developmental talks. And I think at that point, we need to discuss which Noels we're going to use. This is <clears throat> a point of confusion and maybe a point of controversy as some people try to establish turf. <laughs> because generally there's, a, there's an agreed upon difference in the design 
of developmental versus reproductive studies. It's uncommon for reproductive studies, for example, to be done by Gavage. Developmental studies are typically done by Gavage, not by dietary administration. But there are some reproductive type studies that have been done by Gavage. And they go on for several months, not for several critical days in pregnancy, but they go on maybe for a couple generations that animals have been dosed by Gavage. Well, as a result, it gets kind of fuzzy sometimes whether you call something a developmental study versus a reproductive study. I have focused more so on whether or not, I think in general the reproductive studies are looking at endpoints that are different than the endpoints that define the phthalate syndrome in that it would be more difficult to identify pups with some of those phthalate syndrome effects in a reproductive study. For example, if, if a pup doesn't look right, a mother will eat it. So you don't have a counting of 100% of the pups in a reproductive study. In a teratology or an experiment in a developmental tox study, you do C-sections. So you see 100% of the pups. There isn't a chance that some of those that were very malformed would have been consumed by the mother. So there are a number of reasons why I think the reproductive studies are less sensitive to identifying the effects of the phthalate syndrome than the developmental tox studies, where you're not dosing for three months, you're dosing for four or five days that are critical. And you're looking directly at the newborns or the fetuses in a way that you're more likely to detect these structural abnormalities than you would in a, in a reproductive study. If, if people think they're going to identify phthalate syndrome effects through a multi-generation breeding protocol, uh, that may not be the right conclusion because you, you will, it decreases the sensitivity of being able to detect those effects. So. I messed up as I created the first version of this table on no whales because I included a study that was more developmental in nature than it was reproductive. And fortunately, Phil pointed it out to me and I took it out and replaced it with a different study that in fact had a, about a tenfold higher no effect level. But it was pro appropriate, it was the best no whale that we had for that phthalate for that design. So it, it's it's not, 100% clear that that one's developmental, this one's reproductive. But w we, we need to look through all of it. And that's why in the table for mine, I identified that one column as being, as whether or not the Noel was a phthalate syndrome effect or some other effect that was detectable in a, you know, like fetal death in a, in a reproductive study. That's one of the sensitive measures of an effect of reproduction is the litter size. Well, that doesn't give you much information about the phthalate syndrome, but it identifies this chemical as a reproductive toxicant. So th that kind of discussion needs to go on between Phil and me all the time. Just in the sense of process, I mean, are we meant to do an analysis with the reproductive different than the, to the developmental, or, or, or should we come to a sort of a blending of the two, maybe the, perhaps the most conservative group. Well, it, 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 it's been my sense that what we're most concerned about <clears throat> are those studies where there is evidence of a phthalate effect, in a unique one the, of the phthalate syndrome. And that would drive the hazard index evaluation as opposed to the fact that we have decreased fetal weight mm -hmm. or we have fetal deaths or we have some other endpoint that is related to that phthalate, but is not part of the phthalate syndrome. So I guess that's something that we should discuss, but my assumption has been that at least the phthalate syndrome effects have a higher priority and it's a, it's a neater part of what we're trying to evaluate than bringing in all kinds of other extraneous toxicology responses that may make it more difficult to understand whether this is really a phthalate effect or not. But, but is it reasonable to assume that the phthalate syndrome um, reference doses or NOELs would be lower, more sensitive than? That's not necessarily. 
That's something we should be able to answer. Yeah. That's yeah. another question for the parking lot. Yep. I mean, if, if there were, for example, a, a study done, a reproductive study where the exposures were done in adults to phthalates, and they found an effect on sperm quality or fertility or some such, and the Noel was lower than any developmental tox Noel, then we'd have to we'd have to discuss and say, well, maybe that's a Noel we need to use. I suspect that won't happen, but we'll have to see. Well, there, you know, for it depends on the phthalate for the ones associated with the phthalate syndrome, that may be the most sensitive endpoint, but for the others, it probably isn't. Um, I think you, I, I look at it as for the cumulative risk, you might want to look at phthalate syndrome endpoints, but if you're looking at individual chemicals, uh, you may, I would look at whatever the most sensitive endpoint is that might not be the phthalate syndrome and that's gonna i think be a item of discussion if that ends up being the case yeah just a comment from my experience of having done many developmental tox studies in rats mice and rabbits and reproductive studies on the same chemicals in rats generally I think there's enough of a difference in, this, in the sensitivity of those kinds of studies between development and reproduction, uh, yeah, development and reproductive studies. I can't remember any examples where the reproductive studies had a lower no ale than the developmental talk studies. And I, don't, I wouldn't say that it's automatically because development is more affected. I think it has to do with the sensitivity of the design of the studies. You know, when, you, when you're counting pups in a, in a cage, that's, that's a pretty low level of sensitivity. When you're looking for very, very subtle changes in the ossification of bones in the sternum of a large number of fetuses from a large number of litters, that's a different level of scrutiny than what you get with, with just counting the number of pups in a cage that are left from yesterday. Both what uh, Paul and Bernard said brings up another question for me. Do you plan to add a chapter on comparing the potencies of the different phthalates? Like something on the relative potencies? Because we have seen that uh, looking at the non-observed effect levels, we have a lot of different studies made in different points in time and looking at uh, slightly different endpoints. And uh, in the cumulative dosing studies, like uh, that some of excerpts have been published by Earl Gray, uh, you can see that they had problems using this published, not observed, uh, adverse effect levels in generating data for their mixture studies. So they looked at the ED50 values to prepare mixtures on the relative potencies. And this is, uh, as you can see in Chris and my approach, case two. So that we, on the one side, of course, look at the infill studies with the non-observed effect adverse effect levels, but also on the other hand side, uh, at studies that really enable us to compare the relative potencies of the different phthalates. So I would, I would like, I can help you, of course, I would prefer to also see a chapter on comparing the relative potencies of the different phthalates because sooner or later this will have to be a decision we have to come down to. Does it have to be a separate chapter? Can this be yes, included a on... Separate the, section? It could yeah. be included in, in these no. tables in some way that, that when we look at it, we look at the relative potency as a, you know, right alongside of what we have here. Not a, not a, s a chapter on its own, of course, but just some kind of conclusion or a, well, a but final but paragraph. If, but, but if you put the information in the table, either relative potency XXX versus minus minus minus, and you know, all down the list, that helps, I think, drag that conclusion simply into this section rather than making it a little bit. I agree that we need to have this information 
in there in terms of how what's put in the report is important. Because while we think of writing this and reading this from front to back, mm -hmm. there are very few people who are going to do that. And there will be people who will open up this report and want to know where is the discussion about metabolism and potency. So it has to be identifiable in a table of contents or in an index so that people can find it mm -hmm. as opposed to having it scattered among 10 different mm -hmm. chemicals. Mm -hmm. And in that context, I would think, I mean, uh, I'm not the expert in pharmacology of the phthalates, but it seems like their absorption is extensive and rapid. Their rates of their half-life of elimination is probably pretty consistent from one to another. So it's not misleading metabolism and distribution and elimination wise to do that comparison. And the potency probably reflects the biological effect, mm -hmm. not a consequence of the metabolism. Mm -hmm. so I think it would be a good place, a good thing to have in there someplace. Mm -hmm. This is, I think you could say, simply rather than having it spread out. And, and we have to be aware that there's not really much literature out there looking at the, or, or comparing the different potencies of the phthalates, mm -hmm. naming which of the phthalates are really the potent ones, which are the lesser potent ones, which are not potent. So I think it's important that we kind of sum it up based on the most recent literature. And you would do that based on no L's or low L's? That's, that's exactly the question I raised because it might be difficult. We might have to look at some of the mixture studies that are right now going on because they had the problems mm -hmm. using the nulls to, to combine, look at the, to, to prepare their mixtures. And they looked at the effective dose level at the ED50 mm -hmm. values to, to, to prepare their mixtures. Potency means at least two different things to different people. And one of them to some people means the nature of the effect that it causes at whatever dose level. So if you have something that's carcinogenic, it's more potent than something that's not carcinogenic, according to that endpoint. Mm -hmm. The other group of people who are trained more as pharmacologists and toxicologists think of potency as causing an effect at a certain level of exposure. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think we were, we're interested in comparing what, it, what are the no effect levels for the various ones and are they you know, less than 10 milligrams per kilogram per day or they are you know, they 10 to 50 or are they over 1,000? Mm -hmm. And that's another definition of potency, but we have to be aware that there are at least two different audiences looking for different things in, in the question of potency. Well, to add to that, of course, you can uh, compare the potency of phthalates by looking at um, median effect doses, yes. but you can also compare it by looking at uh, some other measures of effects, smaller effects. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I don't, I would, would hesitate us having to get into this discussion, but I think potency comparisons cannot easily be made on the basis of no else, but I'm not sure we should go there. The simple reason being that if you understand how no else what they are, they are not associated with the same magnitude of effect. So you can't easily compare them. That's right. But, yeah. And, and I'm not clear, since I don't do these kinds of studies, I'm not clear how you would derive potencies based on these in vivo studies that I'm citing. Andreas, can you, uh, you seem to have, you need a rationale behind creating the mixtures, as Earl had it, or has it in his studies. And this rationale is not solely based, as you said, on, on the knowles or on, on, it has to be based on something else. Yeah, it's based on the um, dose response relationships of all the individual chemicals, so you have that. But the, the, the issue is the way, for example, we have done it and the way our Grace our, our lab do, does it. You can, for that, you, you mostly want to characterize the responses around median effects. It doesn't, uh, it's a totally different kettle of fish if you want to 
design what we call a low dose mixture study. That forces you into going really finely into doses associated with very small effects. The, you know, these are two separate issues, two totally separate demands in terms of experimental study, in terms of investment resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yes, for those studies where <coughs> mixtures were conducted, say, and then mixture ratios constructed uh, in, in proportion to median effect doses, you could compare the potency, but um, yes, it is possible. But Andreas, would you agree that if you had benchmark doses instead of no L's, that it would be easier to look at Absolutely, potencies yeah. for benchmark doses? Yes. Do, but do, do you want to calculate benchmark doses for all? Well, I don't know. I mean, is that, are you, when you're doing your reviews, do you actually identify, are you looking at a no L versus a benchmark dose? Or are there benchmark doses that you're seeing? Rarely, if ever. Okay. Yeah. I don't know that I've seen one study that had a benchmark dose. But I mean, the, the trick is getting consistent endpoints and if you if the data are there we can do them easily enough actually Kent has been for the the 10 touch reviews that Versar is doing Kent has been calculating benchmark doses but I don't know if they're all the same endpoints I mean we could something we could look into well perhaps when I complete my table of the studies that I think are the best studies for a no well, we can then look at those and go back to the papers and the data and see if we can, from their data, calculate a benchmark dose. Yeah, I mean, the, the calculation isn't hard. It's finding the right dose response data. Yeah. yeah. But I would still support to add some data, as you said, on the 50 levels on, on, on the potency estimations you use for the mixture studies because mixture and cumulative effects will be one major topic of our task. Yes, yes, Holger, but, but it doesn't, for, for designing and interpreting these mixture studies, it's not that instrumental. It, it will be instrumental and important for other parts of the report. And you, yes, you can lift the data out of the mixture studies, but I wouldn't put it there with, together with the mixtures. But we, we, we can uh, glean a lot. And I think, I think it's a very sensible proposal Phil make, made, just made, look at, look at the high quality studies uh, uh, and see whether in addition to a NOIL we can also calculate the benchmark dose. Dare I say it's lower confidence than ours. <laughs> <laughs> the lower confidence interval. Well, some people would say for comparisons, you would probably look at the, the MLE. I, I don't know. <laughs> We're getting very technical. Okay, so that's um, my section, and it just goes through one after another. And as you can see, as you get to the phthalate substitutes, there's very little and sometimes no information, at least that I was able to find. Um, and that's going to, uh, you know, present a problem in terms of what we say when there's no information. Actually, it's easier. There's uh -huh. no information, so we have to make a decision as to whether we want to request follow-up. I think that's the issue. Pardon me, I missed that. I, if there's no information, there's no information, but the, the problem becomes what do we do is we for request for, for follow-up if there's no information. Request for follow-up. Yeah, research or... Yeah, well, yes. So that, it's a different question when there's no information. Right. I mean, how, I'm, I'm thinking of in terms of how do we factor in to our uh, charge to make recommendations when there's an absence of data. 
there's an absence of data. Yeah. <laughs> you can't make a judgment unless you have definite analogs that you can compare it to, you know, where it's almost mm -hmm. exactly identical, except for one or two components, but uh, we're really getting into the arena of speculation if we don't just say, well, there's no data and we need research to quantify whether there is a danger here or not. So um, as, we, as we proceed, um, we're going to refine these, these documents more and more. And I think it would be, it's really going to help us to proceed if we get these documents emailed out well before meetings and receive back comments so that people in the, on the committee have really read these and, and made comments. That's I think really going to facilitate our, our meetings. Uh, and, and I will, I think, uh, as soon as we leave here, begin to put together the different sections so we have what looks like a, a, a document. Um, and uh, I, did you want to add anything, Vern? I think this back and forth uh, emailing is going to help us reach our deadline. Yep. So just back at looking at your chapter. So when you when you have a bolded table uh, in a table a bolded um, study that maybe reflects the ones that you think are the best, and if there's a discrepancy in the estimate, the NOEL, have a procedure in your mind about are you going to choose. How are you going to select a Noel from that? Do you choose the lowest? Yeah, one? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't put anything into the fact that some are highlighted and others are not at this point, um, because quite frankly, I'm not sure why some of them are highlighted and others aren't. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I will sort that out. Um, but, but just in terms of your thinking, when you're going to look at a yeah. you know, ten different values, how do you? How are you going to choose the one that? Well, uh, many of them uh, can be eliminated simply because they don't meet the criteria. Um, and those that do, um, and again, this is a discussion that, that Vern and I will, will have, but I, I think what we'll do is, is probably choose the one study that has the lowest Noel, and be, be the most conservative. When you have to justify it, just by choosing the lowest Noel being most conservative, why, you know, with X number of studies, you have to justify that selection. What if there are nine studies with a value of X and a study with a value of Y and it's lower than X? Yeah. How do you justify selecting Y? Well, that's of that's going to be that's, that's going to be part of what I what I write at the end of, of these the, the summary section where I lay out the rationale for the, the table. I'm going to have fine. to justify that. That's fine. You know, and as, I long have not done as, that. as long as we have it justified, but you got to be really careful yep. you know, when you do that. Mm -hmm. So that was going to be my suggestion is, you know, it might be that you want to choose a conservative one and then come back and to, uh, you know, something that's not so conservative, whether sure. it's the higher one or whatever, mm -hmm. and just and and then we can do analyses and say it didn't really matter. Didn't matter. Yes. We don't need to split hairs. You yep. know, fifty versus a hundred. It's not going to matter. But uh, there, there need. I guess I would like to say there needs to be a limit of how many times I'm going to run analyses. Some sensitivity analyses I think would be helpful because then people don't get mm -hmm. hung up on. Yep. We can certainly do that. And in, in response to your comment. I can almost assure you that there's not going to be a situation where there's going to be one study that gives me a Noel of one, and then there are going to be five that give me a Noel of a hundred. Okay. It, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Yeah, it's just a matter of just completion and you know, using a sensible approach yep. to summarizing 
which I think are really good tables. I mean, there's there's no question about it. It makes things a lot easier to understand. Yeah. You did end up in that situation where you had one that appeared to be an outlier, mm -hmm. and you had a cluster of three or four other well-designed studies that all have a similar Noel. I think there's a reasonable basis for taking that cluster, and you might even take the average of the Noels, you know, if they're, mm -hmm. say they range between five and 10 milligrams per kilogram, all of them. And then you've got one way down there where it's a 10th of a milligram per kilogram. Uh, I think you have a basis for saying that there was a cluster of Noels at seven. And then there was what almost appeared to be an outlier at X fold below that, I think it's reasonable to point that out in your evaluation, in, in our interpretation. Mm -hmm. and you're, you're right, though, it doesn't happen very often, but I have seen that happen. And you deal with it as an outlier. Mm -hmm. But is it an outlier just because the others didn't design a study that had no. those doses? Is it a dose of a design? No, you have to have a basis. It could be that the, the level of examination of the data was poorly defined in that study that has the very low NOL compared to the standard design where it's very clear how many pups they evaluated per litter, and how many did they do for soft tissue versus for skeleton, or did they do both, all of them for both? So if that's poorly defined and the one that has a very low, or the, the dose preparation is not well defined, they just gave this, but they have no chemistry data to support what was actually there. Those are things that you would take into account by sorting that one, that outlier off and treat, handling it differently than the cluster of those where everything was well defined as it should be. They were equally well done. Down but, but I'd also include equally well done in a similar design. You know, if, if you're seeing mm -hmm. an order of magnitude lower that the other studies didn't even consider, that's... I don't, I don't understand that. Because just because somebody has an order, a much lower number, they're right, and the other five or six are wrong. I, I don't understand that. I it has to be, you have to be really careful on what you're aiming toward. If you're aiming toward consistency and coherence, which is what I do in a risk, in, in understanding risk model, you have to take into account whether or not there's a coherence among the data. Because you have one that's an outlier, <coughs> doesn't necessarily mean it's right or wrong. It could be an outlier that's low or very high. I could use the same, use the same criteria on a high. There's a high one, one here really high, and the rest, seven or eight are really, really low. Does that mean that the one really high is worse or maybe better? Be really careful on how you're going to do that. The only reason I bring that up is I think that's the complaint about the NOEL versus the BMD. <coughs> and so the design plays a major factor. And so if, if different studies have different, you know, large, largely different designs, then you could be seeing an effect. Of, that's, the, that's the point I was trying to make. Thing else being the same. <clears throat> As a transition into my section, I'd like to talk a little bit more about uncertainties about no whales, because there are a lot of them, and they often don't get talked about. <clears throat> Despite the very large number of studies that we've had in front of us to review on the phthalates, there are very few of them that are well designed for identifying a no whale. They frequently involve small numbers of animals. They frequently involve selection of very high dose levels where somebody in a lab is trying to confirm that their mouse of choice either does or doesn't respond to this effect or their rat of choice, whatever it is they're using, or their method of analysis would, would detect an effect of a phthalate. So that's not risk assessment type of studies. So despite this huge literature, there aren't a lot of studies that were truly designed to establish a no whale. Mm -hmm. So we're picking the best from suboptimal studies in quite a few cases. The, de the no whale is highly dependent on the power and the, the background response. Uh, mice, for example, in particular, have very high background of cleft palate. Some strains of mice have 50, 60, 70% cleft palate. And you obviously don't use those for developmental tox studies. You'd never detect anything. Well, 
the rat is resistant to developmental toxic effects compared to some strains of mice and rabbits. So that's another factor to consider that when you establish an effect in the rat and you have a no whale that's dependable, it is pretty meaningful because it's a harder animal to get an effect in. So the power of the design makes a big difference in what you would conclude is an OL. And if it's a study that is claiming to have an OL and they only had four or five litters per dose level, nonsense. If it is a study that had a significant effect in almost all animals and they only used four or five litters per dose level and they only used two dose levels, it's hard to say that, that there wasn't an effect in that study but it wasn't designed according to the minimum standards of FDA or EPA or OECD. So it's a little bit harder to know what to do with positive studies when they're suboptimal in design than it is a negative study when it's suboptimal in design. It truly is dependent on the selection of dose levels, as you've already noted. And because some studies are poorly designed to identify a NOEL, the dose levels are 10, 20 fold different from each other. So there's a huge place there for a no L and a low L, but you'll never define it well with a study that has intervals of 10 to 20 fold between dose levels. Mm -hmm. And especially when they, it's a study on a phthalate and they started at 750 milligrams per kilogram and went up. <laughs> well, we, there are a huge number of those studies in this literature. Mm. The, the distinction between reproductive and developmental effects we've already talked about a little bit, no L's are much more useful within a laboratory or within an organization than they are across laboratories. Because if, if a laboratory has been doing a lot of developmental tox studies and they use the same criteria for selecting the maximum tolerated dose and then spreading the dose levels below that and they have other pilot data to determine how wide the, that spread of dose levels should be, that's the standard way of doing studies in many laboratories. From those labs, the NOELs have meaning. And within the National Toxicology Program, we had standard criteria for the selection of dose levels so that NOELs from one study could be compared to another done by the NTP in the same laboratory because we use the same criteria all the time for how we design studies. So when you've got 10 studies done in 10 different laboratories, and many of them have never done a tox study before, a developmental tox study before, and they just kind of guess at how to do it, those no whales are pretty shaky. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very difficult for readers who aren't developmental toxicologists to know which ones are firm and which are shaky because they, they pretty much look alike in a peer-reviewed manuscript often. But it it's, those are the kinds of things that Bill and I need to take into account so that we, when we have a table of no whales, it's really not gems mixed in with garbage, which is not too hard to come by. Well, is it, with that thinking, is it reasonable then to, to actually identify labs or, you know, authors that, that would fall into your description of being um, of high quality and then let the others be more sensitivity Comparisons to the well, you, you can do that. Let, let me use the EPA labs as an example versus the NTP conducted studies. Earl Gray and his colleagues have contributed a huge amount of knowledge, but not all of their studies are well designed for establishing risk. Many of them are for understanding the mechanism or for establishing the sensitivity of the Wistar versus the Sprague Dolly Rat, for example. So they, they, they don't, their goal in the EPA labs is not to design these magnanimous big studies to have a lot of confidence in a no, Noel. In contrast, the NTP studies are less well known for mechanistic contributions, but the slope of the dose response curve is pretty firm from the NTP studies because of a selection of a fairly mm -hmm. large number of animals, number of dose levels, and the greater the importance and the uncertainty, the more dose levels we would add. And we would add more animals to the dose levels. Or we would duplicate studies. So there are two government labs 10 miles apart 
doing studies with similar objectives in mind, but doing them a little bit differently because th it comes down to the mission of the organization. I know that, not, uh, but that isn't all transparent in publications. It's not a fair way of commenting on it. There are two different philosophies, sure. and I think it's important to consider. But that, I think it's reasonable to say some of that information in these tables would be helpful. Like you're saying, some of these you, as by knowing that kind of information, we would discount some of these more than others. It's one of the value of the NTP reports that Phil referred to, because there, there are studies that would otherwise appear to meet the criteria, but the panel of experts disagreed with how they selected the, N the Noel or Lowell. And it's always noted in there that the panel disagreed with the author about what the, so they might, they might give a different number, but they, they don't just give a different number out of the dark. They, they explain that this is different than what the author said the Noel was. We, we have an obligation to do the same thing. And if, if, again, it depends on the quality of the study and the experience of, of the investigator. And I would, I would not want to second guess the panel of experts who were on a CERHR pan panel because they collectively had much more experience than, than I do. So I wouldn't be inclined to second guess them and I wasn't there for the discussion. But when you have the paper in your hand, then it comes from you don't know where, and you have never seen a paper from this lab before, and it looks a little bit, you're, un, you're uncomfortable with what thought might have gone into the design of this, then I wouldn't mind interpreting it myself, just based on what I see and comment that <coughs> you know, the reviewer's interpretation is such and such. So we can disagree on a no ale but we have to be very clear about documenting why. Mm -hmm. And if Phil and I and, and Russ can be helpful to identify w what are the studies in here that really have the best quality to them that probably gives the best number, I mean, that, that's, regulators do that all the time. So what you're saying then is that at the wrap-up of, of each of these chapters, then there may be a <coughs> final table that takes sort of that synthesis that you're talking about, up with a single number yeah. from these so from this larger table. table. My, my, and I think Phil has done the same. My tables reflect that process having gone on already. So <coughs> all of those submarginal studies, I just don't put in. Okay. I don't have a table yet, but there will be one. <laughs> and I think if you look at the end of. Yeah, on page 12, so I have a short paragraph derivation of Noel for DBP. So there will be one of those, and that's not complete. Um, there will be one of those for each phthalate. The table that I have in the front of my section is section 7, is that right? Is, is more of a distillation than what Phil's tables are. His have, his, his have really reproduced a lot of the experiment, a lot of what's in the report, and I haven't attempted to do that. But I, what I have, I boiled it down to the minimum beyond the name of knowing what the no ale is mm -hmm. and what endpoint drove it, primarily trying to distinguish whether it was something from the phthalate syndrome cluster of effects versus some other reproductive endpoint and then the reference. So mine is a pretty minimalist approach. I guess it could be a table of the, this could be a summary of the tables of yours. So I, I would ask those of you who are looking at using no whales whether this table has enough to be helpful. <laughs> 
Or, and I think if any of the Noels from your table are going to end up in the hazard index analysis, I think we need to have more robust discussion of that compound. That follows back in the text. It hasn't been put in a table that's get between the, the text and, the, and this table. I, I can create more tables like what you have if that would be yeah. helpful. So, I mean, right now I would say don't do anything, but we'll see what happens when I complete my analysis. Yes. And, Mike, a question for you. Are there more tox reviews coming yet by more chemicals? But uh, on the CDs that you have, there are, um, I think, eight finals. And there's two more coming. You, we just, got, I just emailed, actually Friday emailed one to you that came in late, and that, that was dimethyl, and then diethyl is the last one. So there's one more coming. Um, so we've got uh, somewhere, in, somewhere in my notes, we've got a, let's see, a set of, you know, 20, We've got a, a 30 some tox reviews of phthalates. Um, this last group of 10 are relatively high priority ones. Of course, we had the, the six that are covered by the CPSAA. You got those yeah. uh, a year ago. Um, since then, we've given you, uh, I think, maybe 19 or so that were uh, sort of lower priority ones. Um, and then right now you've got eight of, uh, eight of the 10. Uh, what we did after the six, we took all the other phthalates and prioritized them. And um, you got the low priority ones first. And now you've got on that CD uh, the 10 top priorities after the first six, if that makes any sense. Um, and so you will, and I can ex actually explain that a little bit better when I get to my part, but um, I'm going to go through all of the, what we have tox reviews for. I think I'm number five. So, Mike, if you compare, will you be comparing your data with the summary table? Well, the plan initially is for the panel to have these to use, uh, to have all that information uh, there to use. I mean, obviously, you've done a lot of writing. In reviewing these things, in reviewing the... Uh, different sections, I'll make, I'll do the best that I can to make sure that you have all the pa relevant papers and, and that this point out what's not consistent or something like that. Um, what I hope to do is put together some sort of table, you know, I prepared that uh, overview of phthalates and um, actually burn if you look in section five, there's a, the, after the text, there's a giant table. We're up to uh, 51 phthalates. Now that includes, uh, that includes the, the six phthalates in the, in the regulation. It includes uh, anything where the production is high enough to report to EPA, that's more than a quarter million pounds a year, or 25,000 pounds a year, whatever the threshold is. Uh, also, what's reach registered, and then there's a couple like dipental that we added because of, more so because of academic interest, because they, they cause those effects. It's not commercially significant. So we've got a total of 51 chemicals. Um, 
and I'm uh, to the right of that, well, table just says why it's on that list. Um, the second page, actually, if you go to the last page, it tells you what uh, what we have tox reviews on, and there's a few that don't have tox reviews, and I'm not sure we need them. Most of them, there's no data anyway. Um, but uh, you can see under CPSC, it shows how many we've, so we have done a total of, uh, well, 27, really 25, because I'm double counting the, the um, cast numbers for DINP and DIDP. Uh, so we've done 25, uh, six of those were peer reviewed. Versar's doing 10, um, and they're almost done. And then we've got reviews from others, the NICNAS and the, the CERHR reviews. Um, and what I hope to do is make a table at some point, I've started to, showing what for each of these phthalates, what data they have, what kinds of studies, what endpoints they saw. It would be a, a, you know, a crude summary, um, but at least we'll have a sense of what causes the phthalate syndrome and so on. Um, but it's a lot of, a lot of data. The, it, put, making sense out of it will be a little bit of a challenge in terms of, you know, the branched versus linear or, or however you want to want to do it. Yeah. We, we as a committee need to make sure we agree on what's in our domain. Now, among these that have been provided with CPSC reviews or Versar reviews, we have to make sure that we're all looking at the same ones and that we're not inconsistent. Yeah. In, in the, I highlighted in the green cells are the ones that are of particular interest in terms of the risk assessment. That's either because of biomonitoring data or because of animal data or because they're covered by the CPSIA. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I didn't really think it was that high. Mm -hmm. I see, I counted 16 that are highlighted, but two of them are the, you know, because of duplicate cast numbers. So, I, is it 14? Table are you looking at? Or are you looking at? I'm, well, it, it almost doesn't matter. Any one of the <laughs> tables. So uh, which one, which one are we talking about? If we look at the green? last page of that. the light green? Yeah, the ones that I highlighted in light green. So those three are on the last page and the rest are in yeah. two. Yeah, yeah this is not, not this thing here. Yeah, I know, I, that was my first um, mistake. It's the ones that are in light green. Yeah, Correct? right. You have the dark green and the yellow in the middle. I was yeah, yeah. And Sorry. That's 16. It, it, well, it's 16, but DINP and DIDP have two tox, uh, two cast numbers, so it's really 14. Okay. 14 yeah. phthalates. Right. The numbers in the multi that one column are, it's the number of tox, tox line hits, which gives you just a, a crude estimate of how much uh, the database, how big the database is. And you could see some of them have five or less. The dark green ones have minimal data. 
Some of them are high production volume chemicals. Right. And in there, um, tables two and three give production data, or production data. In this case, it's domestic production, which, of course, isn't the whole picture. Um, the interesting thing is there's a high degree. We have production information from EPA and from a, a market report. The years aren't exactly the same. Uh, they match up pretty well, but there's a few exceptions where they don't match up well. And you can also see some trends. I mean, obviously, DPHP is, uh, has gone from nowhere to, to one of the top ones. The di-2-propylheptyl Um, it's number 33 on that list. I have been trying to read that. It's on the next page. Uh, let me up there. are so many there aren't even enough abbrevi abbreviations to go around <laughs> and a lot of them sound alike I mean there's you know C8 C6 to C8 and C6 to C9 and so on so, like third time. Yeah. well I'm sure uh, I'm sure there there's a lot of overlap in in the uh, content of some of these mm -hmm. mixtures Mike, but we should still be aware that DEHP is one of the phthalates that is on a worldwide basis, one of the phthalates that is produced in the highest volumes. Oh, absolutely. And uh, we do have some data um, on production in other countries. It's a little less detailed, but um, I haven't seen any uh, anyone do a, I haven't seen a summary of total production worldwide, but um, the for the most part, I think no matter, you know, whether you look at Europe or Asia, I think the, you know, the top ones are still the top ones. And, you know, the ethyl, methyl and ethyl seem to be declining a little bit, definitely methyl. Um, and, of course, the DPHP, and there's probably a couple others that are growing. So we're, anyway, we're still filling in uh, some of the blanks on these tables. I mean, these are the ones that, these tables are complete. The others, we still have a lot of data to enter the PCAM properties and in the health endpoints, but wish that were done, but it's not yet. I think it's uh, time to adjourn for lunch and. Um, Supposed to convene again at one, but I think we'll be a little bit later than that since it's so okay. late. Okay. Well, do you want to call it one thirty or whatever?